does the sight of an abdominal x-ray make you feel like this? Don't worry if it does. In the next 15 minutes, we're going to learn how to interpret any abdominal x-ray from start to finish. To produce an abdominal x-ray, a radiographer will aim an x-ray source at the patient. X-rays will pass through the patient's body, with denser body parts absorbing more x-rays than less dense parts. The difference in the volume of x-rays that can pass through the patient's tissue is picked up by a detector behind them. These differences can be put into an image using computer programming. More dense tissue, such as bone, absorbs a lot of x-rays and the corresponding image appears white, whereas air in the abdomen will allow x-rays to pass through easily so it appears black. Less dense than bone is soft tissue and fluid, which therefore appears slightly less white than bone. Less dense than soft tissue and fluid is fat, which will appear slightly less white. It's important to realise that the abdomen often contains very little air, which makes it difficult to identify soft tissue structures. In a chest x-ray, air acts as a natural contrast to the surrounding soft tissue, and it's therefore easier to identify normal and abnormal structures. This is a big limitation of abdominal x-rays, and is a reason why they are performed much less frequently than chest x-rays. In modern medicine, a CT scan of the abdomen is much more sensitive and specific for different pathologies. Despite this, it's still an essential skill for a doctor to be able to interpret them. In the defence of abdominal x-rays, they're always going to be a cheaper, faster, and less radiation exposing image than CT scans. So, when might an abdominal x-ray be useful? One of their best uses is to identify bowel obstruction. This occurs when there is a blockage in the lumen of the small or large bowel. This can have many causes, and we're going to cover these. A pneumoperitoneum can also be picked up on an abdominal x-ray. Pneumoperitoneum means free air in the abdominal cavity. Bowel inflammation, in the context of inflammatory bowel disease, can also be identified on abdominal x-rays. This is a less common indication for an abdominal x-ray. Finally, abdominal x-rays can be a good way of identifying the presence of foreign bodies. The mnemonic we used is CBBC. This stands for checks, bowels and other organs, bones and calcifications. We start our interpretation with checks. For this, we follow the structure RIPE, which is slightly different to the one that you might be used to in chest x-rays. Here, R is for right patient. We have to check the demographics for the patient, as well as the image date and time, to avoid interpreting the wrong x-ray. Next is inclusion. This is a reminder to check that you can see the whole of the abdomen, from the base of the lungs to the femoral heads, and also from left to right. Projection refers to the position of the patient relative to the x-ray source. Abdominal x-rays are usually anterior-posterior, or AP, with the patient supine, which means lying on their back. Occasionally, abdominal x-rays are taken AP with the patient standing. This might be performed if the patient can't lie flat, or if you want to visualise free air in the abdomen more clearly. Exposure refers to the volume of x-rays that have passed through the patients, similar to exposure of light in a camera. Too much exposure produces an image that's too dark, whereas an underexposed image will be too light. Once we've completed checks, we can move on to B for bowels and other organs. We firstly need to distinguish the small bowel from the large bowel. We can do this using three main features. Firstly, the small bowel has valvulae conoventae, which are mucosal folds that are generally visible across the whole width of the bowel. The large bowel has horstra, which look like sacs, and form lines that don't usually cross the whole width. Generally speaking, the small bowel is central, and the large bowel is mostly peripheral. This is particularly true of the ascending colon, descending colon, and rectum, which are retroperitoneal structures so don't usually move from their position. The small bowel should be three centimetres or less in diameter. The colon should be less than six centimetres. 
and the cecum, which is the first part of the large bowel, should be less than 9 cm. This is known as the 369 rule. We should always apply the 369 rule by checking the widest part of each of these bowel sections to rule out obstruction. This x ray shows small bowel obstruction. We can tell it's small bowel because it's central and it also has valvulae conivente. And you can tell it's obstructed because the width of the lumen is over 3 cm. The appearance of small bowel obstruction on an x ray is sometimes referred to as a coiled spring. Small bowel obstruction is most commonly caused by adhesions, which is when fibrous scar tissue connects tissues and organs in the abdomen after surgery. These tissues and organs should not normally be connected, so it can result in obstructing the flow of food through the small bowel. Other causes include hernias and cancer. This x-ray shows large bowel obstruction. We can tell it's large bowel because you can see the ascending and descending colon on the periphery, and the bowel also has horstra. If you were to measure the width here, it would be over 6 cm. Causes of large bowel obstruction include cancer. This could be in the bowel itself, or from another organ in the abdomen that compresses the bowel. Diverticulosis, which is outpouchings of the bowel mucosa that project into the lumen, this is usually linked to a poor diet with low fibre intake. A volvulus occurs when part of the bowel twists on itself and its surrounding mesentery. This will occlude the bowel, similar to twisting a long balloon. In adults, this would generally occur in the sigmoid colon, or sometimes the cecum. Hernias can also cause large bowel obstruction. This patient has a sigmoid volvulus where the sigmoid colon has twisted on itself and its surrounding mesentery. This x-ray shows the classic coffee bean sign. The loop of bowel typically points towards the diaphragm in a sigmoid volvulus. Notice here how the proximal bowel is also dilated as pressure is building up behind the obstruction. This patient has a sequel volvulus. This is less common than a sigmoid volvulus as the cecum is usually retroperitoneal and therefore is more difficult to twist around the mesentery. However, in a small proportion of the population, the cecum is surrounded by peritoneum and therefore susceptible to twisting. Pneumoperitoneum means free air in the peritoneal cavity. This is not good and can be a result of intestinal perforation. It could also be caused by perforated ulcer in the bowel it's less worrying in the context of recent abdominal surgery, where air can be introduced into the abdomen when an incision is made through the peritoneum. This generally doesn't cause the patient any discomfort and is self-limiting. This x-ray shows a pneumoperitoneum. We can tell this because of Rigler's sign. Rigler's sign, also known as double wall sign, means that both sides of the bowel wall are visible. This only occurs when there is air both inside the bowel and surrounding it. In these cases, it's also useful to get an erect chest x-ray, as when the patient stands, the air will rise to the top of the abdomen and be visible beneath the diaphragm. Occasionally, bowel wall inflammation can also be visible on an abdominal x-ray in the context of inflammatory bowel disease. There are three main x-ray findings associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Firstly, thumbprinting. This occurs when the large bowel wall is inflamed and as a result, the horstral folds become thickened. The folds have the appearance of thumbprints. This x-ray shows the other two findings. This patient has toxic megacolon. This is essentially large bowel dilation without any mechanical obstruction. It occurs in ulcerative colitis and can be fatal. Toxic megacolon is also usually associated with fever and hemodynamic instability. This patient also has lead pipe colon sign in their descending colon. This is a feature of chronic ulcerative colitis. Here, the muscle of the colon hypertrophies over time and obscures the normal horse folds. As a result, the colon appears smooth and featureless. As part of B in our mnemonic, we also need to check other organs. 
These are mostly tricky to see, but it's important to have a go at identifying them to rule out any obvious abnormalities, such as organomegaly. The next B is for bones. On an abdominal x-ray, we should be able to identify the lower ribs, the five lumbar vertebrae, sacrum, coccyx, pelvis, and proximal femurs. When scanning these bones, we should look out for any fractures or lytic lesions from bone tumours. This is a patient with prostate cancer. He has bone metastases due to disease progression. This can be seen throughout the pelvis, proximal femurs, lumbar spine and sacrum as generalised sclerosis throughout the bone. C is for calcifications. Here we're looking for anything white. This can be a result of pathology, for example stones. It could be iatrogenic, either purposefully inside the patient, like a vascular stent, or accidentally inside the patient, like a piece of surgical equipment left behind after an operation. It could be something that the patient self-administered, either orally or rectally. You might be surprised at some of the emergency department cases. Or it could be from penetrating injuries, for example shrapnel in a road traffic accident. This patient has multiple gallstones sitting in their gallbladder. Gallstones aren't usually visible on an x-ray, as they are most commonly made up of cholesterol, which isn't radiopaque. However, less commonly, they can be made of a mixture of bilirubin and calcium, which is radiopaque and therefore visible on the x-ray. Abdominal x-rays therefore aren't the best imaging choice if you're looking for gallstones. We typically use ultrasound, or a more specific test called MRCP. This patient also has stones, but from a different organ. These are kidney stones sitting in the right kidney. It also looks like there's one stone that's made it through the ureter and it's now sitting in the bladder. Kidney stones are usually radiopaque, as most of them contain calcium. However, some of them are primarily made of uric acid, so they're not always visible. Kidney stones will typically get stuck in one of three places, either at the start of the ureter, where the ureter passes over the top of the pelvis, or at the end of the ureter. This is because these are the narrowest points. The calcification on this x-ray is pancreatic calcification. This is usually a result of chronic pancreatitis. It's a late sign of the disease. This x-ray belongs to a patient who swallowed a nail, which has luckily passed through the GI tract without causing any perforation. At this point in its journey, the nail is in the distal ilium, just before the cecum. This patient didn't require any surgical intervention, the nail just passed naturally. In this young patient, there are two obvious calcifications. Firstly, in the small bowel, there are nine magnetic balls that have been swallowed. The magnets are all in contact with each other, forming a row, and they appear to be in the same section of small bowel. However, a CT scan confirmed that some of the magnets are actually in different loops of the small bowel, and they've come in contact with each other by pinching together pieces of the bowel wall. This pinching of the bowel wall has caused ischemia and necrosis, which has punched out holes in the mucosa, causing perforation. The radiodense circle in the pelvis is a bladder full of urine that contains intravenous contrast. This IV contrast was given to the patients before the CT scan. This child required an emergency laparotomy to remove these magnets and also to fix the perforations in the bowel wall. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you found this video useful. It helps my channel a lot and it means I can continue to make educational videos for medical students. I also have a full video tutorial series on abdominal x-rays. You can watch it using the link in the description.